we're going to continue our discussion of the meaning of suffering in general, why it happens. We'll also talk in this part about the meaning of human suffering. But first, last time we, uh, we ended with a discussion of, um, of justice and the three aspects of it and how those aspects were being carried out, fulfilled before the incarnation versus after the incarnation. And what we saw is that the incarnation is, um, is really the divine remedy, this uh, amazing solution that God came up with to the problem of our corrupt human nature. The incarnation was the regeneration, the radical regeneration of human nature. Um, if Adam was the head of the human race, which we know he was, um, the new head is Jesus Christ. And um, we are the members of the body whose head is Christ. That's what the mystical body of Christ means. Um, so the question then becomes, well, why do we still suffer after the incarnation? Didn't that solve all our problems? Well, it, it, it didn't solve all our problems in the sense that we're still, we're still wounded. Uh, you know, when we're baptized and the fruits of Christ's redemption, of Christ's redemptive incarnation, which included every moment of his life and death, um, when, when that's applied to us in baptism, that, that is a regeneration. It's a, a major upgrade, right? Like going from a clunky old Model T Ford to a brand new um, Lamborghini. Uh, it's, it, it's a major upgrade of our nature, but it's still a wounded nature. It's still a wounded nature. It's like if uh, a classic example, I've heard it so many times, um, if you know, if you have wood and there's nail in the wood and you take out the nail, that's like taking out the sin, but there's still a hole left over. Well, it's kind of like that with our fallen nature. Uh, we still inherit a fallen nature from our parents. We still inherit that. And um, certainly baptism transforms us and, and is necessary. But, but there are reasons why we still suffer even though the incarnation happened. And one of those one of those reasons is that if we're looking at the aspects of justice, we have to realize that retribution and correction are still happening. And retribution and correction are painful. It's just it's the nature. Um, we are a work in progress uh, and we're not saved yet, but we're on the way to that. And, um, you know, we, we, we hope and pray that we'll make it to heaven. But of course, um, right now, even, even though we're baptized and regenerated, we are still undergoing the retribution and correction that we talked about at the end of last lesson. And of course, that's going to hurt. The second reason, and probably an even more fundamental one of why we still suffer, uh, is that we're capable of hurting each other. Uh, this is just a sad fact of life. Um, people hurt each other. Um, people are cruel. Um, bullies do damage. There's, uh, you know, all kinds of, of um, taking advantage of the weak and the vulnerable. Um, many, many sins that we could just spend hours naming, but what all of that comes down to the abuse of human freedom. And so we, the regenerated, we who rejoice in our regeneration in Christ, we can still get hurt by other people and we can still hurt other people. That causes suffering. Now, there is another reason why we still suffered after the incarnation. That is that God can use evil and suffering to bring about a greater good. And um, this is often hard to understand because when, when we or other people are going through suffering, we don't always see the purpose Sometimes it doesn't seem like we're getting any benefit from it. But what we do know is that God allows things to happen. And if he permits something, it's for a reason. Whatever happens, happens only with the permission of God. So let's take a look at, at how this works. I want to offer a few simple examples. Right? The first one is um, um, an actor. He used to be famous and well-known. Uh, some of you may have read the books or seen the old uh, TV show, Little House on the Prairie. So you know who Michael Landon is, but um, he played Pa Ingalls in that series. And, uh, you know, he had a pretty successful acting career. Well, my point is that 
he uh, he actually his his original passion was was throwing the javelin. He was a really good javelin thrower, and uh, he got very good at it. Set many records, school records. Um, was trying out for the Olympic team, and the future was really bright for Michael Landon while while he was at USC. Um, well, the problem is that one day he was warming up, and he wasn't even really doing competition. He was just kind of throwing to practice, and he completely ripped his shoulder, just totally ripped the tendon. Um, I think it was the rotator cuff, and he could not really even lift his arm. So he went to the doctor, and they told him, I'm sorry, but you are, you're never going to throw the javelin again. So, of course, he was completely depressed, just entered this downward spiral and didn't want to do anything, just wanted to drop out of school. And that's how he went about for a while until he saw, um, he just saw this flyer posted on campus, auditions for a play. Since he had nothing better to do, he thought, hey, maybe it's a good way to meet people. And he was starting to come out of his depression a little bit. He, uh, he gave it a shot. And it turned out that a friend of his, who is um, pretty serious in acting, also was at the uh, the audition. The friend got rejected, and Michael Landon got accepted. And this was his very first acting role, and led to a very successful acting career. Now, years later, uh, Landon was being interviewed, and uh, and the interviewer asked him, "So, what was the what was the worst day of your life?" And Landon goes, well, it's obviously the day that I tore out my shoulder and, you know, dreams were crushed and I entered into depression and all that. So he told the story. And then the same interviewer said, well, what was the best day of your life? And Landon said, it was the same day. It was the same day. And what did he mean by that, folks? He meant that even though the injury was terrible at the time, if not for the injury, he would never have tried acting and would never have found his his true career. And even he, years later, was able to recognize uh, this terrible tragedy as a blessing. This is what God does. He allows things to happen that seem terrible in the moment. And sometimes, years later, we, we realize it was good. Sometimes we never realize that it was good. Or sometimes we never realize that something good came out of it. And even centuries could pass before anyone would realize such a thing. But if God allows them to happen, it's only in order to bring about a greater good. Another example, um, this is someone I know personally. I've changed his, I've changed his last name just, you know, for privacy's sake. But, but um, Ed Wright, and uh, I know his family too, he was a great football player. He was, uh, he was a wide receiver. And... Um, he was he was definitely the best player uh, on his high school team. Um, he went to the University of Colorado and was um, one of the top players in college. When he was a junior, he was already being uh, recruited by by NFL teams. Um, so the future for him looked very bright as well. So one day in a game, this was I think his junior year in college. He was at a game uh, versus the University of Oregon, and um, he caught a pass. It was it was a high pass. He had to jump for it, so he jumped up for the pass and caught it in the end zone. So it would have been this glorious touchdown. And in fact, I think it did count as a touchdown. But what happened as he was catching it is um, the tackler came in while he was in the air basically flipping him so that Ed fell into the end zone on his head. He fell directly on his head. This is the kind of injury that can, um, <clears throat> that can paralyze or kill, as you know. Uh, so Ed went unconscious on the spot. Um, he was in a coma for, I think it was six weeks. And during that six weeks, no one knew if he was actually going to wake up or not. Well, let me tell you a little bit of the backstory. And the backstory is that even though 
Ed's future was bright and things were going well in his life. Um, his, his family was not very united. His parents were going through a bitter divorce. Um, and then the kids, he had, I think, uh, five or six siblings. It's a pretty big family. They were divided somewhere on mom's side, somewhere on dad's side. And so there was, you know, bickering among the siblings. It was a terrible situation. And, um, the, uh, you know, the family temporarily forgot all of their, all of their troubles. And even though the parents still, you know, were, were not talking to each other, uh, the parents both loved their son. And so here's what they did. They, they did 12 hour shifts where, you know, mom would do 12 hours and then dad would do 12 hours and they would do shifts so that someone was always by Ed's side in case he woke up, in, in case he woke up. And they kept this up for, for weeks. Well, what started to happen is that, you know, at the end of one 12 hour shift and the other would show up, there was some overlap. And so um, Ed's parents started to, you know, exchange a few words here and there. Um, maybe it was just a few minutes, then it was 10 minutes, then it was 15 minutes. And pretty soon they were having a bit of an overlap of about an hour when one shift was ending and the other shift was beginning. So little by little, over the six-week period, um, Ed's parents at least began to talk to each other and be civil to each other. And they were still planning on getting the divorce, but at least they had some kind of civil relationship. So six weeks into it, Ed wakes up miraculously. This was huge. And um, um, it was great news, answer to prayers. But unfortunately, he he had to relearn everything. It was like it was like being born again. He had to learn how to how to walk, how to eat, how to tie his shoes, um, how to dress himself. Uh, Ed basically uh, returned to childhood. Now, um, as this was happening during the six week period, well, I'm sorry, after the six week period. And during the rehab period, uh, when he had woken up from the coma, uh, the, the parents had no choice really but to teach him everything that he'd forgotten. And it was like it was like uh, you know they they were raising their kid again. Well, the good news is that they came back together, and what I mean by that is they started to realize that the divorce was silly, that what united them was their love for, for their son, and that they were just going to stick it out. Now, years later, I can tell you what, what ended up happening. Um, Ed didn't have a full recovery uh, in that he couldn't go back to exactly the same life as before, and obviously no, you know, no NFL career. But he he holds down a job he lives a normal life he's very happy uh, the parents became more united than ever they even founded this um, this ministry to help to help struggling families and struggling marriages the uh the, the siblings all rallied around uh, the parents and their brother they're a more united family than ever um and Ed himself, I would say, received a blessing in disguise, which is he now he now has this certain innocence and holiness about him that really comes with simplicity and humility. It's why Jesus loves the children so much and why he always said in the Gospels, let the children come to me. So what is the bottom line of this story? I'm not saying that the injury was a good thing. But what I am saying is that certain good things came out of the injury that probably wouldn't have occurred otherwise. Now, the last and greatest example that we're all familiar with of, um, you know, great good coming out of great evil is what happened to Jesus Christ. And we sometimes forget that what happened on Good Friday is the single greatest atrocity ever committed in the history of mankind. Yes, we call it Good Friday, but Jesus Christ was murdered after he was tortured brutally 
and his mother had to watch it all. This was the greatest sin ever committed. A terrible, violent torture and execution of God himself. This was a greater sin than, than any in all of human history. But how can this be? This great sin committed by the Jews and Romans, killing God. How did that lead to our salvation? Because God knows how to bring the greatest good out of the greatest evil. Only God can do that. And we say that the cross triumphed over sin because what put Christ on the cross was sin. Literally, people committed sin by killing him. And of course, since we are all united in one human race, our own sins were present there too. But the point is that our salvation came as a result of what was a sin. Not that the sin was good. There is no way that you can call the torture and execution of Christ a good thing. It was not. It was a bad thing. It was a bad thing. But a great good came out of this bad thing. Now, we have to ask a few other questions. Because what we're doing is we're not just taking all these things at face value, but we are going deep. And apologetics is about going deep. It's about getting a deeper understanding for the things that you've already learned in the catechism since you were little. Why did Christ suffer at all? And I ask this question because really, if you think about it, um, the incarnation already did the job, right? Uh, we talked about how it regenerated human nature, how it now um, allowed men to enter the kingdom of heaven, and how um, really it undid this terrible state of original sin. So why did Christ suffer at all? What point does suffering, the suffering of Christ have? And I, I also ask this question because the fathers of the church have said that that, um, you know, the passion of Christ is not the only way that Christ could have saved us. In other words, if God the Father had so desired, he could have made our salvation have come through the simple incarnation of Jesus to regenerate human nature. So let's first ask why Christ suffered at all, and then we're going to ask why he suffered so much. Okay, first, why did he suffer at all? Various things that we have to keep in mind to make sense of it. First, the Father didn't desire it directly, but permitted it. There is a big difference between desiring something, something directly and permitting it. So let's say, I don't know, one of my, say one of my sons is learning how to drive, and I see him backing out of the driveway, and I see that as he's backing out of the driveway, his rear end is going to hit the garbage can. Okay, well, I could run out before it happens and say, stop, you're going to hit the garbage can. And there'd be nothing wrong with doing that. But I choose to let him hit the garbage can because I know he's going to learn the lesson better if that happens than if I rush out to tell him. Okay, did I really want him to hit the garbage can? Well, of course not. I don't want my garbage can to be hit but I allow the garbage can to be hit because of the lesson value that it has. Okay, so there is a difference between desiring something directly and permitting it. And in the case of Christ's suffering, the Father did not want it. To say that the Father wanted Jesus to suffer is equivalent to divine child abuse. It's saying, oh yeah, um, uh, yeah, I want my son to suffer. Mm-hmm, yeah. Want pain for him? Yep, because I'm a loving dad. No, come on. But he permitted the suffering of his son. That's different. And he permitted it for a greater good, which we're going to examine. Second point is love, not suffering, is what gains merit for us. So there's this kind of weird, morbid attitude that some, you'll sometimes pick up from Protestants or even Catholics, which is kind of, it kind of goes like this. Oh, yeah, um, 
uh, pain is pain is where salvation comes from. That's right. And every inch of that nail going through the, the hand of Christ, yep, pain, 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 because pain saves and pain redeems. And it's the sacrifice of blood that atones. This is some pretty violent talk, right? See, here's the thing. Pain has no value in itself. It's the love with which the pain is accepted. That has value. Someone could get burned at the stake and be blaspheming and complaining the whole time, and we wouldn't call that a martyrdom. It could be cursing God while being burned. Okay, that's not a martyrdom. But someone burned at the stake could be accepting it and praying the whole time and even rejoicing in sufferings for God's sake. What, what, what's the difference in these two situations? The difference is love. Love saves, not pain. Now, how does pain fit in? Because when pain is endured because of love is when it becomes meritorious. Pain on its own has no value. Pain endured through love has much value. Now, regarding what we were just talking about, how love, not suffering, is what has value. Well, um, we see that in uh, several parts of scripture. I'm just going to give three examples here. Um, and Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt, so burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obedience to the voice of the Lord? Surely to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of lambs. All right. So this is the context is Samuel is talking to Saul because Saul conquered the Amalekites, but didn't quite obey the Lord's command. Um, and Samuel's criticizing him for this. He's criticizing Saul for his disobedience. And what Samuel's really saying here is that the value of sacrifice is obedience. If you offer sacrifices, uh, even painful ones, but there's no obedience, no love there, well, then it's worthless. Another example we have in scripture is um, from Hosea 6. For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. This doesn't mean that the burnt offerings are bad. Of course they're not. But it means that what gives the burnt offerings value is obedience, is love. And the very essence of redemption is obedience. Jesus says words to this effect too. He says, go and learn what this means. I, deserve, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And mercy, which is love, and it's also obedience to the command of the eternal father, um, is going to involve some sacrifice. It's gonna involve some pain, but, but it's not the pain by itself that has the value. And, and so to sum all this up, we can really just boil it down and say that the essence of redemption is obedience. Uh, you, you know, we, we talk about redemption in something as mundane as, as sports. Uh, I don't know, let's say I'm playing a basketball game and I miss, uh, I, I go to the free throw line three times in a row because I get fouled three times and I miss all six of my shots. Terrible, right? Uh, but then I get fouled a few more times in the second half of the game and I make all my free throws. And so the colloquial expression is, oh, uh, I redeemed myself. Okay, but what exactly does that mean? It means you make up for something wrong that you did. Well, this is what Jesus does for us. He atones, he makes up for it. But how does he do it? He does it by obedience. You see, original sin was all about disobedience. And especially it was about um, a, a certain distrust that preceded and provoked that disobedience. A distrust in the goodness of God, not really thinking God loves us, well, not trusting in his command. And, 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 and that caused disobedience. Well, how was that to be undone? How was that to be redeemed? By perfect obedience, the perfect obedience of the God-man. And yes, that included suffering. Of course it did. But the value of that suffering was the loving obedience with which it was endured. 
the value of that suffering, of Christ's suffering, was the loving obedience with which it was re endured. And that heroic obedience undid the disobedience of Adam. And um, we see that in quite a few um, examples of scripture as well. I'm going to give just a couple examples, a few examples here. For example, we have Hebrews 5, 7 through 9. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Obedience is what it's all about. Loving obedience is the essence of redemption, which undid the disobedience of Adam. We also have uh, Romans 5, 17 to 19. All right, and in Romans 5, 17 and 19, just a second, St. Paul says, if because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Once again, the essence of redemption is obedience. It's not pain. Of course, it can include pain and often does when it's heroic. It often includes pain. In the case of Christ, it included excruciating, literally excruciating pain because he was faithful to the Father's will. But what gave that pain value, what gave it redemptive quality, was not the fact of the pain, but the fact of the love, the obedience. And we have another scripture example. And this is in John, uh, I'm sorry, in Philippians 2, 5 through 8. All right, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Over and over and over we see that original sin, disobedience, wreaked havoc on the human race. But what regenerated the human race was the obedience of Christ. First, in becoming one of us, that was already huge, as we've already discussed. And then, being so faithful to his mission that he incurred enemies who put him to death in the most gruesome way. But yet again, it bears repeating that what's, value about, what's valuable about the passion, in, you know, specifically, and suffering in general, is love, loving obedience. And um, I, I'm going to give some more examples. And the reason I'm giving these examples is because I want to emphasize the fact that the essence of our redemption isn't pain or the pain of Christ. It's the suffering with which it was born. And I'm going to keep repeating that because it's so important. So first I'd like to read from Hebrews 5, 7-9. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation 
for all who obey him. Yes, we obey the obedient one, the one who with his obedience undid the disobedience of Adam. We often um, talk about redemption uh, in, in kind of a mundane way, like a classic examples in sports, right? Someone does badly in a sport and then does well. We say he redeemed himself. If during the first half of my basketball game, I missed six free throws, but then during the second half, I, I, I made 10, um, I could say, oh, I redeemed myself. But what does that mean? What does redemption mean? Redemption is making up for something bad that was done. And in the case of our redemption, what that meant is that Christ, with his loving obedience, has made up for the sinful disobedience of Adam. See, this is the essence of redemption. But notice the essence of redemption is not pain. Of course, of course, obedience is going to include pain. And heroic obedience will include pain. Any heroic sacrifice does. But, but what is the value of that heroicism? It's love. It's obedience. Okay? This is not to take away anything from, from the gravity of Christ's pain or of any human suffering, but it's to show that the redemptive nature of Christ's suffering was because of love, because of obedience. All right, let's look at another example. And this is uh, from St. Paul, Romans 5, 17 to 19. If, because of the one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Again and again we see in Scripture that the essence of redemption is loving obedience. This is what Christ did. This is how human nature was regenerated. The sinful distrust and disobedience of Adam that thoroughly corrupted human nature has been undone by the perfect loving obedience of Jesus Christ. And we see this as well in one final example I'm gonna show or share with you, even though many could be offered. And that's from Philippians 2, five through eight. You've probably heard it before. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is not taking anything away from the cross. On the contrary, it's accepting it and being grateful for it, but realizing that what motivated the cross was obedience. And yes, I'm already starting to sound like a broken record, but that's because this is so essential and so fundamental to our redemption. Now, St. Gregory Nazianzen, great doctor of the church, said it in this uh, succinct way, quote, non assumptum non sanatum est, and in Latin that means what has not been assumed has not been healed, or what was not assumed was not healed. And what he means is that when Christ assumed our human nature, took on humanity in order to share with us his divinity, when he did that, he came to heal every aspect of human nature. And just as he sanctified human nature by taking on humanity, he also sanctified suffering itself by taking on suffering himself. That's what Nazianzen is referring to. 
referring to the fact that Christ has taken on every aspect of, of human nature, including suffering. Now, we can say that the passion of Christ, um, which fits into this discussion of, of pain and suffering, the problem of evil, uh, we can say that it's both substitution and representation. All right, it's not just one or the other. It's, it's both. And before I explain that a little bit more, uh, I'd like to use an analogy that, um, that I know William Lane Craig, one of my favorite apologists, he likes to use. I learned it from him. And it goes like this. Um, in, in baseball, in the game of baseball, there's a position called pinch hitter. And pinch hitter, the pinch hitter is the one who, um, who bats in place of someone who's not very good at hitting. Uh, that particular player might be really good at, in the field, um, you know, first base, second base, outfield, whatever it is, but, but um, maybe he just doesn't hit well. And, and so the pinch hitter then takes his place. But that's an example, example of pure substitution because if the pinch hitter hits a home run, well, that helps his batting average. Um, the, the, the pinch hitter gets credit for whatever he does. Um, he purely takes the place of someone else. Right, so that would be pure substitution. Pure representation uh, would be like the player's agent, uh, the, you know, the major league player's agent. And that agent is going to attend negotiations with the player, but the agent will speak on behalf of the player, negotiate a better salary, better terms, benefits, whatever. Um, but, but what the representative achieves helps the player, helps the representative too. Um, but but it, 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 it mainly helps the player. So this would be a, an example of pure representation. All right, redemption, the redemption um, carried out by Christ is really both. It's, it's, it's substitution in the sense that, that at he, the God-man, underwent a hellish death in time so that we, the fallen men, would not undergo the death of hell in eternity. Notice there's language of substitution there. But it wasn't only substitution. If it were only a substitution, then you know, our actions, our sufferings would mean nothing. It's also representation because Jesus, who took on human nature, became the new head of the human race, replacing Adam. We are cells of that mystical body of Christ. He's our head, we are the members. Which means what the head does, the members also participate in, and vice versa. But, but this is how redemption is also representative. Our Lord gives us a part in redemption, even though he doesn't have to, but he chooses to. And we'll talk just a little bit more about that later uh, when we talk about the meaning of human suffering. Um, but for now, we're focusing on the passion of Christ and answering the simple question of why Jesus even had to suffer at all uh, instead of just taking on human nature. Now keep in mind that just taking on human nature was already a huge step down and already included a lot of suffering just intrinsically because, because you know, there were a lot of sufferings to the limited human life that Jesus took on. All right, but we're talking specifically in, as we answer this question about uh, the so-called so extra sufferings, right? The extra pains um, that Jesus endured during his life. But now the even deeper question arises, which is, all right, I get why Christ suffered. First of all, I get why he became man. I get why he took on humanity. I get why he suffered. But, but why so much? Why the passion? Why that extreme brutality and torture? And what we can, what we think of as we answer this question is that, is that yes, the essence of redemption is obedience. The reason that we have been regenerated or, or the cause of our regeneration is, is the incarnation. But, um, but Christ was not content to do the minimum and actually did much more for us than was even necessary. Um, I'm going to be giving you some of the reasons for the passion that uh, that St. Thomas outlines in the Summa. I actually included that here, the third part, questions 46 to 49. 
Um, but but what we have to remember is that is that strictly speaking, um, the the redemption, our redemption, could have happened in 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 any way. Really, uh, didn't have to be crucifixion. Um, you know, if I'm if I'm going to travel, let's say I'm, I'm so I live in Los Angeles, and I'm going to travel to San Diego. I, mean, I could walk there. I could even crawl there. I mean, I'm going to get there. Um, which means it's not absolutely necessary for me to, you know, take a car or a bus. But but we all know that that the best way to go is by car or bus. Okay, same deal here. Yes, we could have been saved without a passion. But as I'm about to show, the fact that we were saved with a passion was so much better. So much better for so many reasons. And the first of those is that nothing says I love you more than suffering for the one that you love. And that's exactly what Jesus did. It's easy to say I love you to somebody, but it's quite another thing to do something that hurts for somebody. Well, we in our hardened hearts and our corrupt nature, if, if, if we had learned about a Jesus who simply became one of us and didn't go through something like Good Friday, we might have doubts about just how much he loves us. But, but because of the passion, there is no doubt. When you see the crucifix, when you see Jesus on the cross and contemplate that, there's, there's no way that you can doubt that he loves you because he did that out of love. It was the greatest proof of love. And this is one of the most important reasons for why the passion happened. Another example, or sorry, another, another uh, reason, is that Christ set an example of obedience, humility, patience, etc. He taught us how to suffer. He suffered like a lamb led to the slaughter, opening not his mouth. He, he suffered serenely. Now, of course, that doesn't mean it didn't hurt. Of course it did, but... but he taught us how to suffer humbly, obediently, patiently, which means that because the passion happened, we've been taught a lesson that we otherwise would not have learned. Another reason is that the passion showed the gravity of sin and why we must avoid it. Okay, we all know sin is bad. We all know that sin corrupted human nature. And that, of course, made necessary our redemption, but, 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 we can sometimes forget just how offensive it is to God. However, when you see Christ hanging on the cross, when you contemplate that, you see just how terrible was the sin committed against him. And yes, the greatest sin ever committed was the brutal torture and execution of the God-man. That was the greatest sin ever committed. And that greatest sin ever committed we can see it, we can see uh, the blood, we can see the thorns, the nails through the hands and feet. And so the passion then shows just how serious sin is and why we need to avoid it. The passion teaches us that better than, you know, let's say if Christ just wanted to become one of us and live a normal life and die a normal death at a ripe old age. Okay, it still would have been loving, but, but that wouldn't quite have shown us the, uh, the, the gravity of sin like the passion does. Now, another thing is that the passion was virtually inevitable. And what I mean by this is that um, since Christ was so faithful to the Father's will, did everything he was commanded, um, he made enemies. He made enemies. Uh, the Pharisees didn't like him. The Sadducees didn't like him. Uh, the Romans, we don't, you know, have any proof in the Gospels that they hated him, but, uh, you know, they were the ones who carried out the execution, so they probably didn't like him either. The point is, the point is, that sooner or later, he had it coming to him. Sooner or later, he had some kind of attack coming to him, whether it was crucifixion or, you know, Getting, getting jumped by a bunch of thugs, whatever. Um, that's what we mean by virtually inevitable. Yeah, he could have escaped in Gethsemane. He could have easily just run away. But then imagine, 
what would that look like to us? We, the heart of heart. We, the stubborn, sinful ones. We would look at the Garden of Gethsemane and him running away as kind of a lack of love. I mean, face it, that's what it, that's what it would look like. And so if the only real way for him to escape the cross was running away, well, then that just wasn't an option. And this is what we mean by virtually inevitable. Another reason is that it was fitting. In fact, it was extremely fitting. Fitting that by dying, he conquered death. By being killed, he conquered death. By being sinned against, he conquered sin. But most of all, most of all, by loving obedience, he conquered distrustful disobedience. By loving obedience, he conquered distrustful disobedience. Another reason for the passion is that we can unite our sufferings to his and thus console the sacred heart and help him carry the cross. And the awareness of his sufferings unites our strengthens and consoles us in our sufferings. When we're going through pain, it, it comforts us to know that Christ went through pain. It comforts us to walk with him uh, on, on the way to Golgotha, right? On the way to that place of the skull where he was crucified. It, it helps us to know that the God-man trod in our footsteps and suffered what we suffer. And because God, Jesus, in his divine nature is outside of time, in his divine nature, in, in, in his human nature, he's inside of time. In his divine nature, he's outside of time. But if Jesus in his divine nature is outside of time, then whatever I do now can actually console him in the past. My fidelity now can console him 2,000 years ago. This is a great mystery, but it's one not, that, that not only holds up to philosophical reflection, but is also in the message of, of many saints, including St. Faustina. We talked about her earlier when we were talking about uh, divine mercy. But, but Christ revealed to Faustina that he was consoled on Good Friday by the future fidelity of the saints. Consoled on Good Friday by the future fidelity of the saints, including us, right? We're trying to be saints including us 2,000 years later. And finally, the reason for the passion is that it was, it was an overpayment, a wonderful overpayment of debt. And that's precisely because there's more merit in that which is difficult. Right? We instinctively know this. We, we respect a job when someone has a job that requires work and sacrifice. We respect that a lot more than we respect a job that's just really cushy and easy. I mean, just, it's just human nature. It's just something we understand. We get that. Something difficult matters more. And what could be more difficult than the passion of Christ? Okay, he, he, he suffered for us because he wanted to overpay our debt. Just a normal life, incarnation, regeneration of human nature, um, just normal sufferings, already a huge step down from being divine. That could have satisfied retributive justice, corrective justice. That could have brought us to the state that um, we, we had before we lost it, the state of original justice, the Adam and Eve had before original sin. It could have, but, but Christ was not content to pay our debt. He wanted to overpay our debt. An analogy I like to use is, um, let's say you have a, a wealthy gazillionaire uncle, okay? And this gazillionaire uncle gives you all, all kinds of uh, great birthday and Christmas gifts. And, and it's just so generous. Um, and, and, and one day you get a traffic ticket. It's a pretty steep traffic ticket, too. You went through a red light, the cops saw it. And, and it was in uh, an area where going through a red light, they charge you $1,200 for the ticket, and you don't have the $1,200. So you call, you call Uncle Bob, say, Uncle Bob, I'm sorry to call you and uh, you know when I need something, but could you please help me out of this bind that I'm in? Uh, I'll try to pay you back when I can, but I don't have the $1,200, Uncle Bob. Can you help me out? And Uncle Bob says, uh, sure, I'll, I'll help you out. Look for the... Uh, look at your bank account in a couple of days and, and you should see the transfer. So you say, thanks, Uncle Bob, and you hang up and 
go about your business. Well, a couple days later, check that bank account, that bank account, and and you look, and you can't believe your eyes because he didn't transfer twelve hundred dollars to you. He transferred sixty million dollars to you. Overpaid the debt by so much. But that's how God works. God does way more than necessary. Look at the wedding of Cana. He didn't have to just, or he, he, he could have just made a little bit of wine, get them through the wedding. No, he made 150 gallons of wine, six stone water jars. And at that time, six stone water jars would hold about 150 gallons or more. How about the loaves and the fishes? He didn't just multiply loaves and fishes, but he did it in such a way that 12 baskets were left over. Overpayment is the MO, the modus operandi of God. He just does it because he's abundant. And that's why. Not content to just become one of us, which was already great, and just regenerate human nature. He overpaid our debt so much that the future glory we're capable of is greater than we would have had if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned. And this is amazing. Another analogy is that you can think of the incarnation made us open cups instead of closed cups. So let's pretend, let's pretend that um, the cup is, is the human race, right? Or, or a representative human. And before the fall, the cup was full of water. And let's say the water is, is, is sanctifying grace, the presence of God, union with God. Um, original sin happened, and cup is now empty. The cup is not only empty, but it's closed. Can't receive grace, totally corrupt human nature. If the incarnation alone had happened, okay, well, great. Open up, grace cannot be received right back to where we started, all is good. But Jesus did more. He took on human nature and went through the passion, which made us capable of receiving even more God into us, of becoming even more united to God. And that's why instead of open cups, we, because of an incarnation that included the passion, we are buckets that aren't only capable of receiving grace passively, but it's like a, you know, Fantasia style where you've got uh, the, the brooms with arms. And think of buckets with arms, right? Pretend I'm a bucket right now in my arms. I can actually scoop that in. And how do I scoop that in? Not because I have my own merits, but because I can participate in the infinite merits of Jesus Christ. He allows us to. This is what overpayment of the debt means. That's how fabulous this is. So a good analogy of this is the child's allowance. And not every child gets allowance, but um, but for those who do, the way it works is, you know, the child, let's say, seven-year-old Bobby. Uh, if he does his chores and does his homework, then daddy's going to give him $5 a week. All right, well, let's think about what that means. Um, that $5 a week is, it's not Bobby's money. I mean, the one who earned it is Daddy. But Daddy chooses to give Bobby the $5. Really, for just doing chores and doing the normal things, uh, Daddy really doesn't owe Bobby anything. I mean, he's already providing a roof over his head and food and stuff. Um, Daddy's under no obligation to give $5 a week to Bobby for just doing what he's supposed to be doing anyway uh, or helping out in ways around the house that Dad could actually do himself and maybe even better. The point is, though, that once the allowance is given to Bobby, it becomes his to spend. Well, that's, that's us and the infinite merits of Christ. We, we are given a share in the infinite merits of Christ. That's like allowance. Uh, it's not something we earned but we're, we're, we're given it out of mercy in the same way that allowance is given mercifully to the child who doesn't deserve it. But just as the child can spend that allowance, we can uh, destine our participation and merits to the things that we pray for in reparation for, for our sins and the sins of the world, in thanksgiving to God, in praise of the Eternal Father. We have this to spend, so to speak, 
in the same way like that a child has allowance. Not because we deserve it, but because we need it. And God who gives it to us, gives it to us not out of justice, but out of mercy. A mercy that includes and transcends justice. That's why the analogy of allowance is very effective here, because that's really close to what we're doing when we participate in the infinite merits of Christ, when we are mercifully given the ability to earn, to earn through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ.